Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers. Lectures by structural biologists. Unique content brought to you by SB Grid. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the first SB Grid webinar since the last solar eclipse. Uh, or more seriously, the, the SP, Grid, for SP Grid webinar for April. We'll get started in just a moment. So our, our next webinar is going to be uh, May 14th, and that's going to be Darren York, who's going to be talking about Amber. And if you have questions today, then please use the, the Q&A button, and we'll you, you can see the questions there that other people have asked, submit your own questions. And this is a slight change from when we used to be doing sending host questions to hosts in the chat. You can still do that if you'd like, but we've got the, the Q&A as well. And today we've got Brian Tripp joining us from Columbia University, and he's gonna be talking about RF diffusion. So Brian, thank you for agreeing to present today and thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for the, the introduction. Uh, and I'm pleased to be sharing this work on de novo design of protein structure and function with Rosetta Fold Diffusion. Um, this going. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, a modern computational protein design workflow commonly involves a few different stages, all of which uh, are now <clears throat> involving some deep learning methods uh, and in many instantiations. Um, so in, in, in all cases, we, we begin with some sort of design criterion. So think, for example, uh, like having a, a tight binding interaction with some uh, like other protein target of interest. <clears throat> we then seek to identify uh, a backbone <clears throat> for uh, like a, a protein to perform that, that function, <clears throat> then uh, design a sequence to fold into that backbone structure, <clears throat> uh, assemble uh, a large set of these, filter them using some sort of computational filter to come up with a reduced set to then test experimentally, um, hoping for, for some like positive experimental success rate to then get a, a, a few candidates to, to bring to, to whatever <clears throat> other stages further downstream. Uh, so at, at each of these stages, <clears throat> we're now seeing uh, incredibly useful uh, deep, deep learning methods. Um, so in this, uh, this group, uh, I assume that everyone's very familiar with uh, with alpha folds, um, <clears throat> and uh, in the context of, of protein design, this is uh, like been shown to be an incredibly effective uh, like tool for for computational filtering. Essentially, seeing when I've come up with a a, a computational design model, <clears throat> when I take the uh, uh, the sequence associated with <clears throat> this design protein structure, does alpha fold fold this up into <clears throat> the same sort of shape as as I've been designing for? Next stage, <clears throat> working our way a little bit further backwards here, is for fixed backbone sequence design. And this is a, a, a like a, a step at which um, like computational methods, specifically uh, <clears throat> graph neural network uh, methods, have been <clears throat> uh, extremely effective. So, in uh, in our work, I'll be talking about using protein MPNN <clears throat> as uh, like a, a piece of software for fixed backbone sequence design. <clears throat> Uh, and then the, the the first kind of step in this pipeline is going to be the focus of this talk, which is actually coming up with uh, the backbone to, to put into this first stage of this, this pipeline. Um, and uh, Rosetta Full Diffusion <clears throat> that I'll be talking about uh, is, is addressing this stage. Um, from a methodological perspective, <clears throat> a method for uh, backbone generation in this protein design context um, should provide backbones that are physically realizable in the sense that like we can actually find sequences that will fold up into these and, and, and actually give us the, the design backbone structures in the lab experimentally. Um, we want them to be uh, to be functional <clears throat> with respect to, to whatever like functional design criteria we're starting with. Uh, and then lastly, we also want to be able to, to generate multiple diverse backbones. Uh, and again, this is something that's quite important in the context of this design workflow where we're going to be filtering things out at different stages <clears throat> and possible generations can, can fail for uh, often quite unpredictable reasons. Uh, and uh, previous deep learning methods um, <clears throat> for this stage uh, have really like failed to, to meet these desiderata. Um, so 
Rosetta Fold, uh, like diffusion <clears throat> is uh, a method like for, for this uh, backbone generation stage <clears throat> that uh, allows us to not only come up with like new diverse realizable protein structures uh, just by, by generating unconditionally, but <clears throat> also to handle a diverse set of different design criteria. Um, so for example, uh, I'll describe how <clears throat> we can use it to generate uh, symmetric oligomers, <clears throat> use it for, for binder design, design proteins with uh, like desired specified folds <clears throat> for scaffolding functional motifs, <clears throat> as, as well as for um, like scaffolding uh, symmetric motifs as well, putting these into to symmetric scaffolds. Um, before going uh, any farther, <clears throat> I'll say that this uh, this work that I'm going to be uh, like talking about for, for this, this talk was <clears throat> really an enormous uh, collaboration uh, between folks uh, like across Columbia, this is where, where I'm based, University of Washington and the Institute for Protein Design, uh, MIT and, and the University of Oxford as well. Uh, I've put up in this, this top row, um, like the uh, main, main contributors uh, for, for this project uh, initially. <clears throat> uh, but again, this is part of a, a much broader team, uh, listing uh, everyone who's been involved in, in the, the results that I'm showing at the bottom here. Um, as a roadmap for uh, the, the remainder of this talk, <clears throat> um, so I described deep learning and how this is fitting into the, the modern protein design workflow. Uh, I'll give next a bit of motivation for uh, like how, how we think about approaching protein design as a conditional generative modeling problem. <clears throat> Here, this involves this, uh, this main kind of key technical tool of uh, like diffusion generative models. So I'll describe these methods, which have come out of uh, computer vision, <clears throat> and describe how we've adapted them to uh, to, to generating protein structures uh, in, in Rosetta Fold diffusion. Before then going into uh, showing how <clears throat> we've, by introducing these different design criteria as different <clears throat> like pieces of conditioning information, uh, like adapted this this procedure to, to accommodate diverse design tasks. Um, <clears throat> for for those who uh, have come here in, in person. After I've gone through these slides, um, I'll, I'll walk through a brief, uh, yeah, like real-time demonstration <clears throat> of running Rosetta Fold Diffusion just to generate a few uh, unconditional backbones. So, uh, if you're interested in, in seeing that, stick around in the, for for after the talk. Um, great. So I'm going to move on to to talking about <clears throat> this kind of big picture uh, idea of how we're. Uh, approaching design as a conditional generative modeling problem. So here, I think it's it's worth starting and uh, reflecting, like why like backbone generation is uh, is still a, a challenging problem, <clears throat> but something that we can really address computationally with uh, like a, a machine learning based approach. <clears throat> and here, it's it's often been said uh, that in the in the post alpha fold world, protein design, <clears throat> at least with structure based design criteria. Uh, is essentially now just a game of guess and check, right? We can think of guessing possible amino acid sequences, plugging them into to AlphaFold, and then just checking, do they fit uh, our, our, our design criteria? Um, but certainly this alone does not solve the, the problem of protein design <laughs> because there are just simply too many possible uh, like amino acid sequences to check, right? So if we're talking about 100 residue long proteins, <clears throat> right, we have, uh, yeah, like on the order of, of the the the, the number of, uh, of of atoms in the universe, <clears throat> different amino acid sequences that we could think of checking. So we certainly can't think of, of checking them all. Um, a little bit heuristically, I like to think of the space of all possible protein structures as this wide open <clears throat> space. I'm showing this here just in, in two dimensions because that's all I can put on a, on a slide, where only some very small sliver of the space actually uh, corresponds to proteins with uh, our, our design criteria of interest, be it <clears throat> Um, folding up into some symmetric oligomer or, or containering some uh, some active site, say, <clears throat> regardless of, of which of these design tasks I'm, I'm speaking of. Um, so based on this uh, this this observation, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, a number of, of prior approaches <clears throat> have sought to take advantage of existing uh, proteins from nature, <clears throat> hoping to to search through uh, like these existing structures. Trying to identify some that were are close enough to to fitting with the design criteria that we want, <laughs> and then maybe making small modifications based on these. So the fundamental issue with 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 this <clears throat> approach is that even though we have many examples 
of, uh, of structures of, of natural proteins, they too sparsely populate this space. So for a given design problem, we might have uh, like two fewer even <clears throat> uh, like zero solutions uh, to, 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 to solve the, the, the problem that we're interested in. Uh, there have been some previous uh, like machine learning tools <clears throat> for protein design, but for the majority of tasks, these have really had uh, a quite poor empirical performance. <clears throat> so uh, to kind of like overcome uh, these, these challenges and <clears throat> acknowledge that, that there is quite a lot of signal to, to take advantage of in, in proteins of nature, our approach has these kind of two main <clears throat> methodological ideas. So the first is <clears throat> like fitting a, a distribution to uh, the, the proteins that we have from nature. So if we were thinking of, of each of the, the white dots in this space on the, on the right representing examples of, of proteins that we have, what we want to be doing here is somehow spreading some probability mass away from these examples, hopefully uh, generalizing uh, into this, this slice of the space corresponding to, to proteins with their design criteria. Uh, and then... Uh, approaching design as sampling from uh, conditional distributions, <clears throat> thinking of this relative to, to this distribution over, uh, over proteins in nature, conditioned uh, on the design criteria of, of interest. Uh, and in the context of resetable diffusion, we're going to be doing this <clears throat> in, uh, in like a, a built-in way where we're explicitly going to train a machine learning model to, to look at these design, design criteria and sample from these conditional distributions. The rationale for, uh, for for taking this this approach to design is that we'll hit uh, all three of these desiderata that I, that I mentioned at the start. So we'll hope to get like realizable <clears throat> protein structures out because this property will inherit from the data that we're looking at. Um, we'll be able to get uh, like functional <clears throat> new protein structures because we'll be able to uh, directly impose this by conditioning. <clears throat> Again, thinking about these structure-based uh, like design criteria. Uh, and then <clears throat> since the S demand of, of a procedure that's looking for conditional distributions is, is a distribution, <clears throat> um, we can hope to get a number of potentially quite diverse solutions. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk, uh, I guess, next about this, this first <clears throat> step uh, or, or piece here, or how do we even think about <clears throat> uh, fitting a distribution to, to protein structures from nature? Uh, so I'd mentioned uh, at the start that the key technical tool <clears throat> that we're going to be, be using here are these diffusion generative models. <clears throat> uh, and this is a, a method that <clears throat> has really come out of computer vision. So I'll describe how, how this works in this, this general case uh, first developed for, for like, generating new images before describing how we've uh, adapted it to, to protein structures. So uh, the, the essential goal accomplished by a diffusion generative model, as with like any method for, for distribution estimation, more or less, <clears throat> is to sample from some uh, approximation P of another distribution Q that we have access to only through examples that <clears throat> I'm going to write as, as X naught. Um, and the motivation for how we do this with a, a diffusion generative model comes from this observation that while directly sampling from some very complicated distribution can be <clears throat> quite hard, uh, the tasks of one sampling uh, like Gaussian noise that resembles data corrupted with a, a, a large amount of, of Gaussian noise. And then uh, secondly, of denoising data that's been corrupted with Gaussian noise uh, can be much easier. So then a way to, to approach generating something that looks like a new example of data <clears throat> is to uh, that, that, that will resemble uh, an example from from this this distribution Q is to start by sampling Gaussian noise and then iteratively uh, applying a denoising process, um, <clears throat> slowly kind of peeling back <clears throat> uh, bit by bit noise in our data until we end up with something that that really resembles noise free data. Uh, the way that we we realize this <clears throat> in the context of a, of a diffusion generative model is to set up more precisely this, uh, this process of denoising data to approximately reverse a discretized diffusion process um, <clears throat> that we define as starting from our, our data distribution on the right, uh, and then an orange here slowly step-by-step, step, adding bit-by-bit <clears throat> bit more and more Gaussian noise until essentially all of the signal in our, our data are, are destroyed and, and the distribution of, of these noise data are, are indistinguishable from, from this typically Gaussian noise. Um, a bit more formally, <clears throat> uh, we begin by uh, defining these two Markov uh, chains, like finite uh, 
time Markov chains on <clears throat> on this uh, this this space of, of this augmented space <clears throat> of our data, where this first diffusion process is is fixed in the sense that it doesn't have any like learned parameters <clears throat> starting at our data distribution. Then with these Markov transitions, <clears throat> adding uh, this noise going from t minus one to, to t, and then <clears throat> uh, fitting this uh, this denoising process in blue to go in this opposite direction of uh, first sampling pure noise on the left and then denoising step by step. The intuition for this is that if we're able to, to choose this, this first marginal distribution for this, uh, this fitted uh, uh, denoising process, so P of X big T here, to roughly match <clears throat> this implied uh, like marginal distribution at time big T of, of Q, and if we're able to, to choose each of these transitions of P to, to roughly match the implied conditionals of Q, <clears throat> then the distribution that we'll get from P at, at time zero will roughly match what this uh, this this desired data distribution <clears throat> at time zero is uh, Q of Q of X naught. Um, but the way that we, we actually choose these <clears throat> um, is going to depend on, on the way that we uh, define this this noising process and how we add noise at each step. So thinking first about this this first marginal all the way on the left, <clears throat> if the way that we add noise is at each step adding Gaussian noise, uh, for example, with variance sigma squared here <clears throat> at each step, um, then this final marginal uh, like Q of XT will be roughly a Gaussian um, with mean zero and variance T times sigma squared. Uh, but how about these these transitions? How how should we pick the the functional form for p of x t minus one given x t? <clears throat> so again, under this this assumption that we constructed this diffusion process to be adding uh, Gaussian noise with variance sigma squared at each step, <clears throat> um, these conditionals will be roughly Gaussian again this time with variance sigma squared, but now with uh, a mean that. Uh, depends on on the underlying data distribution. So the the next key idea here is <clears throat> to approximate the transitions of of uh, this denoising process by uh, a neural network. Uh, here that I'm writing as uh, like a linear combination of <clears throat> uh, like a, a denoising estimate. <clears throat> so something that will look at at our data and produce this uh, like x naught with a with a hat on it, trying to to recover what. Uh, like noise-free data would, would would look like if you're assuming that you got xt by taking x naught and adding noise to it. Uh, so when you're a combination of that and the and the current state, so taking a essentially a small noisy step uh, towards a, a prediction of uh, this noise-free data. Um, inference in this class of models, uh, yeah, can be understood and in, in approached in a number of different ways. But typically, it's some <clears throat> approach by a stochastic optimization to minimize a callback Leibler divergence between <clears throat> um, this this joint distribution over all of the the, the successively more noisy data and, and our model distribution key, uh, model distribution p. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> this is a kind of the, the general perspective that I've written here, just in the the case. <clears throat> Uh, like suggestive of, of modeling just one-dimensional data, but of course this can be generalized with uh, like multi-dimensional data with with uh, high-dimensional Gaussian noise as well, be it uh, over uh, each of the the three-dimensional color channels for <clears throat> each pixel in an image, or with uh, like analogously 3D Gaussian noise on each of the atomic coordinates of uh, of atoms in a molecule. <clears throat> um, so this is the 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 one really kind of mappy slide explaining these these uh, diffusion generative models. Um, in the in this general case, <clears throat> I'm now going to move on to to describe, uh, yeah, how we we've uh, implemented this idea with Rosetta full diffusion. And here, uh, the, Brian, yeah. what, one clarification question before you move on. So is your the the time axis t there? Is that for different samples and learning the distribution? Is that increasing noise as, as the process goes on? Or I guess it, intuitively, what is t representing in the context of protein structures? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. So <clears throat> there's actually like no like formal kind of like mapping between each of these time steps and something that would actually exist in in a real protein structure. It's just something that we're kind of uh, like adding into this mathematical construction to facilitate uh, like an algorithm. So 
I'll get um, in a couple slides, I'll show kind of a demonstration of what the generation process looks like with these models. <clears throat> um, where, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I, I hope that this, this will become clear later on, but I, I'm happy to, to clarify further if, if it's not. Um, yeah, so I'd say here, like there's this this one kind of ingredient that, that really I've, I've not explained here, which is uh, like what actually is this, this neural network uh, denoising model that looks at XT uh, and, and produces a, a noise-free estimate of the data. Uh, and uh, and <clears throat> like the this choice is, is the main way that Rosetta Fold diffusion <clears throat> diverges from these methods in, in computer vision. Um, and this is in, in choosing the structure of this denoising neural network um, to be uh, like the, the Rosetta Fold protein structure prediction uh, like uh, neural network. Um, so at first this, this choice like might seem a, a little bit odd, but right? we think of, of protein structure prediction as something that, that fundamentally has, has a different input, <clears throat> right? It accepts uh, an amino acid sequences input uh, with the, the predicted structures output. Um, but there's also this, this secondary uh, input as well <clears throat> uh, into to this neural network architecture as, as well as, as AlphaFold <clears throat> of uh, like these initial or, or recycled coordinates that are used across um, like these multiple recycling uh, iterations in, in structure prediction. Uh, so, when we when we use this neural network architecture for RF diffusion, <clears throat> um, instead of thinking of, of the like this this input corresponding to the amino acid sequences, the 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 mean input, we in fact actually mask that out, <clears throat> and then input these like this noisy state xt, these diffuse uh, diffused coordinates uh, as, as that that input uh, there, <clears throat> and then uh, interpret the the output of this and train the output of this um, to be by corresponding to this this denoising prediction, um, so what training in this process uh, like actually looks like is rather than uh, in the context of structure prediction, repeatedly sampling something from the PDB and then predicting the structure from the sequence. Um, for each example we we take from the PDB, we're adding noise to it, putting that into this this neural network, and then uh, applying loss to a prediction of, of this this noise free structure. So there's several properties of of this neural network Rosetta fold that really make it uh, a very effective uh, denoising neural network model. So I'll name some of the, the, the main ones. So first is, is rotation equivariance. <clears throat> so with respect to these, these coordinate inputs, um, what this means is that when, if we think of, of like rotating uh, like an input structure, the output that we'll get will be the, the same but rotated. Uh, and the, the rationale for, for wanting this, this property is that uh, like a protein really means the same thing if we flip it upside down <clears throat> and uh, incorporating this rotation equivariance in the neural network model is going to imply uh, invariance in the, the resulting distribution over structures, which will uh, improve, improve generalization, uh, better spreading mass out through, uh, throughout that space I was showing at the start. Um, another property is <clears throat> using an expressive transformer uh, like architecture. So uh, as with text, it's important to be able to distinguish between like semantically uh, meaningful like insertions and, and deletions within this structure or shifts of, uh, of, of different domains. <clears throat> and that's something that we can, can learn from the data when using a, a flexible ar architecture like this. Uh, a third <clears throat> property is to enforce some biophysical constraints. So the underlying uh, representation of backbones that we work with uh, is, is the, the same that, that's used in, in AlphaFold, <clears throat> which is to represent uh, these triples of uh, the nitrogen, alpha carbon, and, and uh, the, the primary carbon <clears throat> as like uh, rigidly connected with uh, fixed bond lengths and, and a fixed bond angle. <clears throat> uh, so rather than, than just representing all of the atoms in the backbone, this is the this reduces the dimension of the backbone representation and uh, is also amenable to respecting chirality so that we don't generate uh, like mirror images of, of plausible structures. <clears throat> um, and the last property is <clears throat> like more of a, a practical one, which is that uh, like uh, both like Rosetta Fold and Alpha Fold provide like robust starting points for, uh, for code implementations <clears throat> uh, with uh, pre-trained weights as well <clears throat> that can be fine-tuned for, for design. Um, so this is uh, this this engineering point as as well as as being able to to start with pre-trained weights. 
Um, so there one is there is, is one uh, last technical challenge that <clears throat> we need to, to to overcome in order to to really take advantage of this approach. That I'll talk a bit about. Uh, which is how do we actually like do this diffusion modeling approach now though, <laughs> when uh, each of the data points is a chain of these these rigid bodies in our in our representation. Um, so to kind of like address this, a, a first <clears throat> sub question we we need to answer is uh, in what space are we actually representing uh, these these backbone data? Um, so the way that we we represent each of these triples is through uh, like the, the translation and, and rotation of uh, like atomic coordinates of <clears throat> like a fixed triple of uh, some n c alpha and c. I'm writing here as n c alpha and c star with <clears throat> this alpha carbon kind of fixed at the origin, and then <clears throat> the end of the c locked to, to a canonical orientation in a plane. Uh, and then thinking of if we have this chain of, of XNs for each uh, residue N in, in the structure, this is representing uh, this translation and rotation. Um, and again, having a chain of these, then we, if, if it's uh, an N residue uh, protein, we'll have N of these XNs defining these, these region body transformations. More formally, this representation uh, it gives us a, a backbone as an element of the specially Euclidean group <clears throat> dimension three, or, or rather SC3N, because we have N copies of, of this manifold. Uh, and it's often helpful as well. We find it to, to describe this as, as a collection of, of frames. <clears throat> so you can think of placing a coordinate frame on each of these C alphas aligning with the, the N and the C um, as a, an equivalent description of, uh, of this rigid body transformation. <clears throat> So to uh, to then apply a diffusion model to this uh, to 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 this representation, we extend uh, this this method of uh, like Ramanian diffusion modeling um, from this uh, this this paper uh, I'm sitting here is number one, where the key idea is to uh, rather than approximating the reversal of like a discretized um, like. Brownian motion in, in Euclidean space that can be well described as, as using Gaussian noise um, to approximate the reversal of a generalized Brownian motion <clears throat> on this manifold of, uh, of uh, rotation matrices or, or on these, these frames. So what this looks like here is we have this, this forward process, the one that, uh, that that's going to be fixed that we're going to, to use a neural network to, to reverse, <clears throat> uh, that starts with frames representing um, like all of the, the, the coordinates in the backbone. <clears throat> And then slowly destroys that signal, uh, leaving us with these these random frames. Uh, and what we've uh, found is that <clears throat> we can actually, within this framework of Ramanian diffusion modeling, fine tune Rosetta fold uh, using this SE three diffusion kernel on on a, on a denoising task. Um, I promised a, a more of a mechanical description, <clears throat> uh, perhaps more intuitive description of, of what this procedure looks like for generating a new sample that maybe will clarify what the the, the role uh, and meaning of these uh, intermediate XT states are. Um, so I'll do this on, on this slide. So uh, to unconditionally sample a, a new protein backbone with Rosetta full diffusion, we begin by uh, sampling some uh, collection of, of like random frames. So this this random noise, X big T. This says it's pure noise. And then <clears throat> at the first step, we, we take this pure noise and we put that as the input to, to Rosetta Fold through this structure track that's initially used for, for recycling to get a denoising prediction that uh, in this first iteration doesn't even remotely represent a, a realistic protein structure, <clears throat> um, at least at this, this very first step. And then iteratively across a sequence of, uh, in this case, uh, 200 steps, <clears throat> um, we take this sort of noisy step interpolating uh, like towards this this denoising prediction, <clears throat> and you can see a visualization of, of this process here, where uh, at each of the the steps we're getting this denoising prediction, and <clears throat> about half of the the way through this this structure, about time step 100, we start to see these like more realistic uh, like structures forming. Here we have this uh, like three helix bundle here, the de denoising prediction, and then slowly on the left you can finally see towards the end. The XT is navigating towards the structure, so they, they match here at the the final stage of of, of that. <clears throat> and it's really only this final x x zero that we then ultimately care about as as a design. 
uh, here I'm showing uh, 12 unconditional samples uh, from, from Rosetta Fold diffusion uh, generated uh, in, in precisely this way with just some annotation of, of the, the helices and, uh, and, and sheets from like uh, using, using PyMo on, on top of just this simple backbone description. Um, <clears throat> So I mentioned AlphaFold as, as a main source of, uh, of computational validation here. <clears throat> um, what we find somewhat, somewhat shockingly is that right, when we <clears throat> take these generated backbones, propose a, a sequence for it with a fixed backbone sequence design method, protein MPNM, that I mentioned at the start, <clears throat> and then uh, take this, this single sequence input, put it into AlphaFold, and <clears throat> compare the, the folded structures, uh, we find that they can extremely uh, closely agree with the, the generated uh, designs. So I'm showing that this close alignment um, with the, the overlay of <clears throat> the, the generated backbone here in, in gray with the, the alpha fold predicted backbone in, in pastels. Uh, experimentally, we find that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, these are, are quite diverse and, and realizable as well. Uh, in, in this case, I'm, I'm showing validation here with, with a circular dichroism. Uh, these, these results actually have a, have a CD melt uh, where we find as well that, uh, yeah, we, we end up with the extremely high thermal stability. So without the, the secondary structure, uh, like changing much at all when we are, are raising up to, to 95 degrees Celsius. All right, so <clears throat> now I've, uh, I've talked about <clears throat> uh, how, how we're approaching protein design as, as conditional generative modeling in the abstract, and then <clears throat> this first technical ingredient of, uh, of diffusion generative models and the adaptations to, to protein structures. Uh, and now I'm going to move on to, to this next piece of uh, like introducing <clears throat> various sorts of, of conditioning uh, to approach diverse design tasks. Uh, and uh, I've given a, a bit of a, an outline of, of these before, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll walk through uh, yeah, the, the majority of, of these, these design applications uh, in, in the next several slides. So uh, first uh, variety of, of conditioning information, which is, is useful to <clears throat> include in, in some cases uh, is like secondary structure information and <clears throat> the, the adjacency of secondary structure and uh, uh, like elements. So th this is a, a, a fairly uh, prescriptive way to, to, to describe a protein fold. Um, so like in this, this example here, I'm showing <clears throat> Uh, a de novo designed tin barrel um, <clears throat> on the on the left that uh, like we can <clears throat> describe the topology of um, with uh, this this block adjacency matrix where the the dark segments are representing um, like pairs of of uh, of, of residues <clears throat> that are in secondary structure elements that uh, are, are close to one another <clears throat> uh, as well as on the the lower level. Uh, annotations for the the different secondary structure types, whether it's it's helix loop or or strand, um, to to incorporate this into to Rosetta Fold diffusion, <clears throat> we uh, add an additional input to to this neural network model, um, into which we put an encoding of <clears throat> of this uh, this the secondary structure information. Uh, this is used at a training time, so uh, for each of the the training examples in this case. <clears throat> Rather than just putting in diffuse coordinates, we're also putting in uh, this this like binarized representation of this block adjacency uh, to to incorporate the, the protein fold information. <clears throat> so this uh, allows for for a better denoising prediction at, at training time, and then <clears throat> at generation time, right, we can put these uh, these representations of of the block adjacency in to uh, generate new structures with, with the desired fold. <clears throat> so. Uh, specifically uh, for, for this example of this tin barrel fold uh, with the, the block adjacency of, of the sort that, that I'm showing here. When we put this uh, this into to Rosetta Fold, once we've trained it to, to accommodate this information, we're able to get a number of, uh, of different designs that have like the same tin barrel fold, um, but still quite diverse. Um, yeah, like, like overall realizations of, of this fold. <laughs> so uh, these are, are three designs uh, that are again extremely well recapitulated by by alpha fold. So like the sort of like ruggedness and, and jaggedness of, of the helices around here, <clears throat> we think actually are quite 
uh, like well recapitulated in in, uh, in in the proteins that we've designed, <laughs> and uh, yeah, again by circular diaprism, we're we're able to confirm that <clears throat> the secondary structure uh, composition here is uh, yeah is, is is really quite in sync with <clears throat> what we'd expect for for Timbera like this. Uh, so next uh, type of of uh, the conditioning criteria <clears throat> is for symmetric oligomer generation, right? So, uh, like symmetry is is uh, quite a useful tool in the context of protein design for being able to take relatively like small modular components and build up to to much larger, more complex structures. <clears throat> um, this uh, has has historically posed some challenges for for protein design methods. Um, because scaling uh, like methods in, in general to, to handle larger protein structures uh, like it introduces uh, difficulties in, in, in a few different places, um, particularly computationally. <clears throat> um, and here we find that uh, yeah we, we can incorporate this almost immediately uh, into uh, an into Rosetta fold <clears throat> to generate uh, new symmetrical oligomeric structures um, by starting with. <clears throat> Um, not just a, a single cloud of, of, of noise representing one chain, but uh, a collection of <clears throat> like these these clouds of noise that we like symmetrize <clears throat> before we input it into the the denoiser model, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> throughout the the stages of of generation, <clears throat> we're able to maintain this symmetry and end up with a, a final uh, generated design that, that that also maintains a uh, desired uh, like symmetry. So in this case, this is a, a C three symmetric. Uh, a little um, and we've tested this with a, a variety of, of different uh, different symmetries. So I'm showing uh, here in this this first column, uh, like backbones generated directly out of uh, out of Rosetta fold diffusion, <clears throat> in the way I just described um, for these uh, like three three different cyclic symmetries, as well as uh, two different dihedral symmetries. <clears throat> uh, and for all of these, we've uh, I could characterize these these structures with negative stain electron microscopy, um, <clears throat> and you can see on the right that the 3D re uh, reconstructions from EM are, uh, are relatively closely aligning with uh, with with the design models. Uh, another example that that I'll talk about is is motif scaffolding with uh, symmetric motifs. <clears throat> so it mentioned. Uh, like a, the, this this core capability earlier on of, of being able to uh, of motif scaffolding of, of taking some <clears throat> say putative like, like active site for an enzyme would be uh, an, an ultimate goal, but maybe a, a binding interface that's uh, been known from like a fragment docking calculation and putting that in the the context of some design scaffold is is a is a way to approach design problems. Uh, here I'm going to show uh, like a demonstration of, of doing this um, for for motifs that have symmetric structure. So in this case, this is a uh, a nickel binding uh, motif taken from uh, like beginning with uh, like the square planar arrangement of of histidines <clears throat> that, uh, that 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 occurs <clears throat> in the the side chains of of uh, like uh, many nickel binding proteins from nature uh, with a, a constructed <clears throat> uh, like backbone segment like a helical segment uh, here in mint <clears throat> um, by building kind of inverse rotomers out of the, the, the histines that I'm sort of showing with these uh, side views uh, in the middle. And then on the right is, is one example of a, of a design scaffold. So this is for uh, like C4 like monomers uh, and then this confirmation on, on the right. Um, so for this, we can again see that, that what we're generating uh, is, is a realizable molecule um, through uh, electron <clears throat> microscopy. Uh, with a reconstruction that, that agrees with the design model. Uh, to test that this is functional, <clears throat> we can do this uh, using isothermal calorimetry. So for those who aren't familiar with this technique, the main idea is to, to, to get in a test tube <clears throat> some of the, the designed protein and then add nickel into the solution and measure the, the heat release. So uh, in this experiment, uh, what, we, what we expect to see is that as we add nickel into the solution, we'll have heat release in, until we hit uh, an expected saturation point when there's like a one-to-one -one ratio of the uh, the designed protein and the and the nickel that we've added in. Uh, and indeed, this is exactly what we see with this this, this design protein of seeing a, a heat release 
until we <clears throat> hit the saturation point, at which point we sort of drop down to the, to the level of, of the control. This is another case where uh, we've been able to, to demonstrate the ability to uh, get quite uh, like diverse <clears throat> solutions. So these are, uh, yeah, just, just 12 of the experimentally uh, like validated examples that we, we have here. In this case, um, yeah, there are like 44 <clears throat> uh, computational designs that we tested uh, with, with eight, 18 of them having <clears throat> uh, detectable uh, activity by, by isothermal calorimetry. So about a 40% success rate, which was pretty exciting. Um, the last uh, example I'm going to, to, to talk about here is, is a form of conditioning information <clears throat> that we've uh, implemented into Jerusalem diffusion is for uh, like de novo design of uh, like protein-protein interactions. <clears throat> uh, so in this case, you can imagine starting with some desired target <clears throat> to which you want some, some small binding protein. <clears throat> uh, and then in addition to, to having this, this target, <clears throat> uh, uh, it, it's often uh, like desirable to, to specify like where precisely on the, the surface of that target we would want to binder. So these uh, interface hotspots uh, like highlighted in this, this darker orange are representing these, these sites. <clears throat> uh, and uh, yeah, again, starting from, from this, uh, <clears throat> we build up uh, yeah, a new, yeah, can, can, can bind up a, a set of <clears throat> uh, like new uh, protein binders. So this, this task of, uh, of protein uh, binder design has really been a grand challenge in protein design uh, for, for a while with some immediate therapeutic applications. Um, recent work um, uh, a couple of years ago demonstrated for the first time the, the possibility of a general computational method for designing protein binding interactions. <clears throat> but uh, the challenge was that like with this, this prior work, success rates were, were really like uh, really quite low. So on the order often of like 0.1% success rates, which meant that in order to uh, identify a binder, you would have to do like a high throughput screen, say with, uh, with yeast displays is what was used in, in, in this paper, <clears throat> to screen maybe on the order of uh, like thousands or 10,000 <clears throat> uh, like candidates, and then be like quite happy if you <clears throat> ended up with just uh, one or, or, or a few, <clears throat> few binders at the end of the day. So, uh, our approach uh, with, with resetable diffusion um, is, uh, as the conditioning information providing the, the structure of the, the target in these, these hot spots, <clears throat> and we find that this, uh, yeah, has allowed us to get uh, like much higher experimental success rates. Um, so by experimental success rate here, I mean um, <clears throat> like a generated protein where the the like binding KD was below one millimolar. Uh, and this is something that that really is, is exciting because it means that in some cases we're able to design binders um, without uh, needing to do these these quite expensive high throughput screens. Um, so I'll wrap up now just to conclude by saying that uh, uh, resetable diffusion is a, a like diffusion model for for generating protein backbones uh, that's able to to, to yield. Uh, realizable, functional, uh, and diverse proteins for, for several different design tasks. Um, if you're interested to learn more about this method, the uh, place to go is our, our paper on this <clears throat> that we published last year. Um, <clears throat> all of the, the code is, is openly available on GitHub uh, in the Rosetta Commons uh, repository. Uh, the, the GitHub issues are, are relatively active, <clears throat> and I think that the community is, is pretty decent uh, like responding to, to questions here. A um, few questions for, for me, uh, like individually, certainly feel free to, to reach out to me directly um, over email. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for uh, all of your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was very, that was fascinating talk. And you, if I'd if I'd held my question, you would have answered it a couple slides later. So, so yeah, uh, for folks in the audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature or send messages to me in chat and we can un unmute folks. Uh, so I guess one, one question that's more, more clarification than anything else, but when you were talking about the, the symmetry 
for for design. Is that so the distinction there is that along the lines of the constraint versus restraint as far as how you're you were distinguishing the symmetries there? Um actually can can you say maybe again what you mean by constraint versus restraint? Ah yeah I apologize that may not have been a coherent question. So the basically the 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 model there is not give is what's generated is a a subset of coordinates that are then expanded by symmetry to the full set versus having the full set and then the optimization target includes a penalty for there should be symmetry um yeah so i, I think there may be two questions here that i can unpack so a first is are we generating uh, like through the, the the generation procedure, just a single monitor monomer or the entire oligomer. And then a second question is, what is the mechanism of imposing that? Is it with some sort of optimization penalty or something else? Um, so I'm separating these because I, I think the, the answers may be a little bit different from from what you were expecting. So <clears throat> um, we are in fact generating this this all at once. <clears throat> um, so at, at each step of this diffusion model, we're putting in multiple monomers. Um, like essentially as as multiple separate chains <clears throat> so uh, as with with uh with alpha fold with, with rosetta folds um yeah i mean you can can model multiple chain structures <clears throat> um but in contrast to to some prior work also from uh like the, the university of washington um with uh with yeah my my collaborators on on this <clears throat> where the the mechanism for imposing symmetry was to compute some sort of like uh, distance from from <clears throat> what was being generated from being exactly symmetric and push things towards like a symmetric generation uh here we're actually able to directly impose this constraint um and this is something that yeah, was a bit surprising to us and uh ultimately owes to to some special properties of rosetta fold uh like specifically this this rotation equivariance and its permutation equivariance if you permute the the orderings of chains you get the same output permuted this turns out to be enough to to maintain symmetry in the denoising predictions and allow you to starting with symmetric noise at every single step of the generation end up with something that's exactly symmetric awesome thank you and yes my my question was ill posed and you clarified clarified how so thank you uh, so a uh, question from Alessandro, is, is there a certain bias for a alpha helix to come up more often than a beta strand when described in designing a symmetric, symmetric scaffolds? And if there is, do you have any thoughts on why? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd say actually in, in general with all of these methods, we typically found it a bit easier to generate helices than, than beta strands. but. Um, I think there's no kind of special bias towards that in the context of symmetric generation. Um, like for example, in, in uh, two of these structures, uh, like we, we have like beta sheets forming as well. Um, in this this nickel binder case, <clears throat> um, I was showing structures that that all were entirely entirely helical. Um, and in this case, this is I think the the result of uh, a bias in uh, in, in how we we set up the problem, um, so I, I didn't really explain in detail the the construction of of the the motif in this case, but uh, for each of the the four kind of components of of this symmetric motif, we seed this with a, a helical segment. So th this is like three backbone uh, residues worth of of like a helix uh, in in this this starting motif. Um, and I think that that kind of like initialization definitely in this case is biasing towards uh, like alpha helical solutions. Um, Thank you. I would add on to that that one thing that I think is is particularly nice and, and powerful about this framework is the ability to to incorporate a variety of different sorts of conditioning information. Um, so, uh, if for example you were interested in seeing if this could generate uh, nickel binders that that had helical structure uh like this is something that, that in principle can <clears throat> be done using this secondary structure conditioning that that uh i mentioned earlier on as well <clears throat>
So this may this may be a meaningless this may be another ill-posed question on my part, but for the for the conditioning, is that similar intuition to the the image processing diffusion models where you start with an image and you know you turn your image of a cat into an image of a dragon? Is that like too much of a stretch for biologists who are not don't have background to to be analogous here? Um, yeah, I think that there are a number of useful ways to kind of understand how these things are working. Um, I mean, certainly on a methodological level, uh, some of the tricks that we we use for conditioning um, are, are very similar to to the ones that are used in these like generative AI, like Adobe Photoshop extensions and uh, like what you find for image generation and modification uh in, in like chat gpt so I, I think that that's that's a super useful way to to look at it and understand at least at a high level of what's what's going on oh thank you and let's see another question question from sean uh does all right Do, does the in your experience does the the IPTM slash PTM scores from from AlphaFold Monomer how how would those compare as a validation metric for RF diffusion in in terms of um, assessing the the likelihood of a, a good binder or a poor binder? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, something that I'm glad that this question was was asked because I should have made this clear as well here um, that. Uh, so compared to to this non deep learning based design protocol that I'm comparing to here, um, there are actually two two big things that that are 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 helping, and uh, roughly I, mean, I mentioned that this two order magnitude improvement I would say about one order of magnitude is coming precisely from using um, like this predicted confidence from AlphaFold. And in this case, it's like the, the main signal is coming from the predicted aligned error. <clears throat> Um, using AlphaFold as, as a proxy for, uh, yeah, binding here. So using that as as, as filtering <clears throat> um, is giving about an order of magnitude improvement over uh, over over as I designed with the the other order of magnitude coming from uh, like the, the improvement in, in backbone generation here. Um, so I, I think that the, these ideas of using predicted confidence for filtering is extremely complementary to. Uh, Using a deep learning method separately to to generate a backbone, um, it's like to get again to the to the workflow I was outlining on the the first slide. Um, like I really see this as a powerful paradigm of, of things to apply sort of in sequence. Um, does that answer the question? Um, I I think so. And Sean, I will defer. Yes, we have a thumbs up. Okay, great. Uh, and another another question from Alejandro. So, understanding that the designing the binders against polar sites tends to be harder has has that seen improvements lately? Um, not as much as we would like, I would say. So, there there may be some some recent progress on this that I'm not totally caught up on, but. For the most part, um, I think really where where these methods are, are being very powerful is at this stage of um, generating like new backbones with with exquisite shape complementarity, um, and then passing back to uh, like other existing methods. Specifically, we're using protein MPNN to to design the the side chains. So for for these results, this is. Uh, using like a, a roughly two-year-old method for generating, yeah, like everything with the side chain. In, in, in fact, actually entirely agnostic to the placement of, of side chains, just choosing the, the amino acid identities. Um, and I think that that kind of comes with a certain level of coarseness in the representation that uh, is, is not really adequate for, uh, yeah, which it, is not obviously ever going to be adequate for for really precisely getting like good salt bridges and, and polar interactions. So it's an enormously, I think, important area for for future improvement. Oh, 
Thank you. And I mean, you're mentioning two years has me reminded about machine learning years are kind of like dog years where <laughs> <laughs> yeah. things, things progress very rapidly. I guess one, do you have a sense for the size ranges that are typically accessible for designing proteins? I, okay, that was another ill-posed question. So, like, with a, I guess, a realistic workstation or a typical workstation or possibly a typical institutional cluster, is there a certain size that you'd say, whoa, this is too big computationally, or, you know, this is this is fine and it, you should be able to run this with no issues? Yeah, I would say... I mean, like with, with gradient checkpointing and things that we have on by default, I think if you're on like a relatively small GPU, can go up to maybe six hundred, six or seven hundred residues um, for for creating a, a structure. I mean, I would say that since it's so relatively hard and expensive to, to synthesize DNA for a protein that's that long, um, that's kind of getting beyond like how. That's how how big we know that we can can build like having things that will actually work experimentally but uh certainly up to that that length i mean if you're willing to to wait know, like an hour for for a generation is is yeah reasonable on 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 a single like gpu that isn't tiny um and and we've seen produces yeah backbones for which with this fixed backbone sequence design protein and pnn method um, like we can get sequences that AlphaFold will will uh, really quite accurately predict to be to be that structure. Cool, and yeah, that's a very good point. Like you're going to be a fundamentally limited by you'd probably like to produce the actual protein you're designing. Um, that yeah. <laughs> if if that constraint is lower than the computational constraints, then you're in a good spot computationally, or other way around. All right. I guess one one last call for questions, and then we've got about five minutes left. Do you want to try to? You'd mentioned the collab fold if there was time. Do you want to try to fit that in, or? Um. Yeah, I think actually I'm. Yeah, I'll go. I think I, I don't have enough time to to go through that, but I will ah, maybe pause okay. and just give a a cell for. Um, just to, to to point out the the, the GitHub repo that we have. Um, so this is this is is real code. You can you can find it on GitHub. Um, if if you're looking for for like a, a quick entry into like seeing that this actually works and can run, uh, there's there's this collab notebook that uh, Sergey Ovchinikov put together, which is super nice. Um, and and I uh, encourage you to, to take just a look. FYI, what's on your screen is your your slides, not your GitHub. Oh, okay. Um, let me change this then. Uh, your your collab was up for a moment and then it flipped. Okay. Um, can you see GitHub now? Uh, now, yes. Okay. Awesome. So saying this is the GitHub. It's the link that I had up earlier. Uh, Rosetta Commons RF Diffusion. And then if you're interested in uh, this collab notebook, uh, you can open it up and, and run it uh, and, and see a new generation in about maybe five, six minutes. Cool. Uh, All right. Well, yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you again. Everyone for, for your attention. <laughs>